the one. I'm gonna report. I'm gonna start now. Okay. Zina. Yes, Jeffrey. You have rightfully earned your reputation as a very, very skilled pastry chef with a wonderfully creative repertoire and solid grasp of technique. <laughs> oh, where's this going? The history of products. <laughs> uh, you're an accomplished instructor. There's mm -hmm. so many wonderful things uh -huh. about you as a pastry chef. But I was just reading the other day. I wanted to learn a little more about you. And mm -hmm. how could you do it? I saw that you had spent time in a federal penitentiary. <laughs> you were convicted of beating an egg. I know. Oh, it deserved it. It deserved it. <laughs> Don't wear, wear that <laughs> knife at me. <laughs> Chopstick. Hi. Hi. Good to see you again. Episode nine. Nine? Nine. Woo, I'm nine. so impressed. Mm. And now it seems to be summer outside, so things have shifted. It's 85 degrees in Vermont today, folks, hence there's no dress code at all around at here. At all. Um, and today Jeffrey's going to be making brioche. And you are going to? Be making choux, uh, choquettes specifically, which is, are these tiny bite-sized sweet little nuggets of love. Okay. They're my favorite. Well, shoe translates as cabbage. It is ma petite choux, my little cabbage. And I, I love it when you're explaining to students who don't know the French, don't know much about the paste, essentially, and you tell them that it's called pa pa cabbage. They think that cabbage was involved in the making Ooh, of the dough. Well, that would be interesting. Which would be wouldn't really it? odd. But if you see, oh, I don't have any small ones. When you watch shoe grow, when you just pipe a little plop, it it, it grows like in an unruly manner, but it's still round. It looks like a cabbage because mm -hmm. it's got these little bumps as a steam creates that loft. So I think it's the perfect name, and I'm going to be making that now, and Jeffrey's going to be shaping and making some glorious things from brioche. So we're very French today. Yes, we are. Um, but the other thing that I would like to remind you, if you look at the description of the show, you can click on the links of the recipe so you can follow along, but just so you know, we already did the mix and we pre-taped it. So the brioche itself, we're not gonna be mixing that dough live. We did that beforehand because how long did that, that take? That was 20 minutes. It, like, it was over, yeah. I think it was over 20 minutes. Yeah. And that would be us just staring at, there's Jeffrey, see this is you beating some butter. Oh. See, I'm not alone. So there he is, that's cold butter making it more pliable so that it is. it takes the dough takes it up in the mix as opposed to just like essentially spitting it out like a toddler. <laughs> but now I'm going to make some shoe, meaning cabbage. Cabbage. Can and you I'm make sauerkraut with that? <laughs> that would be really odd, but I love sauerkraut. So I'm going to start. This is an induction burner, but at home you would be doing most of this on medium heat. And I have in here already a stick of unsalted butter. Uh, it's room temperature cubed along with half a teaspoon of salt and again you can follow the click on the recipe link It's right there so you can follow it. This is so simple So I'm going to make sure that this is melted before I go anywhere further and I always look for I always call it a little bit of action a little bit of bubbling so that I know that everything is hot enough That when I add the flour that it will seize and thicken almost instantaneously when I teach this, I usually do half water, half milk, mm -hmm. and I add some sugar. I like the color that that brings. Yeah. I really love the caramelization, especially in Eclair. Um, this is a little more simple. This is just water and the butter. Do you not add sugar when you're doing all water? Um, well, this is the King Arthur recipe, so they don't. But what I like about this is that it keeps everything very blonder, yeah. especially for the choquette. So you know you've got a very good bake without having it being overly dark because you want to see those little pearls sure. of sugar. So for the choquette, I actually think this is a preferable way of doing it rather than mine that has that extra oomph with those sugars in there mm -hmm. that really darken the color. What kind of, you have two flowers here? 
or what's that? No, this oh, is a per, this is a Swedish sugar. pearl sugar. So what are you using for flour? For flour, I have all-purpose um, unbleached, so a relative high gluten percentage of 11.7. But this is one and a quarter cup, but mm -hmm. it's 149 grams. Uh -huh. And this is what's important is that I think so many people, when they don't know how to properly measure in a dry measure, might get 149 grams for one cup of flour yeah. anyway. So this is something they that is, they didn't fluff it up. So this is where the scale is so important. If King Arthur flour, their weight measure, and they say 120 grams per cup, that means you fluffed up the flour. When you put it in the cup, you do it very gently and you mound it ever so slightly. You're not tamping it down. If you just shove your scoop in the flour, you're tamping it down and you may very well get 149 mm -hmm. grams. You might not. You might need one cup and a quarter. So why not just get a scale? It makes life so much easier. And here I'm waiting for two things to happen, the butter to melt and for the salt. I don't want to feel those crystals of salt either. Some people add the salt, and if they're using sugar, to the dry ingredients, which I think is a really silly idea because what can happen is that you'll get those granules that yeah. haven't dissolved in the finished paste, and it can cause fissures yeah. in the bake. The other thing that I always explain, too, is that um, you know that sugar gives a, a lovely depth of flavor if you're using it. But when you are doing things with sugar in general, as you were describing in the mix, so you've got to watch that, that it is a liquid ingredient. I also call it the zombie ingredient, because if you don't treat it well, that it can whisk moisture away from, like, say, egg yolks and leave behind, sure. cook them, if you and leave behind pills. For an hour, it is it. such a little dastardly thing. but. It gives flavor and color and lovely stuff. But now you're going to see the butter has melted. And now it's just kind of riding the top. You can see it looks very, very yellow. And I'm just going to wait for some action. I want to see a little bubbling so that I know that this mixture is hot enough. I don't want it going for so long that it's evaporated all that lovely water. But I want to see some of this going on so that I know that when I add my dry ingredients, my flour, that it will seize, it will thicken. And this is almost like a way of kind of mixing this up, making sure the butter isn't just riding the top. And when you add the flour, it just gets coated in the fat. So are you bringing that to a full boil? Or just uh, to almost. It's just like a, a ch it's trembling. Yeah. I take it off. I don't leave it on the heat. I immediately dump in all my flour. And I'm going to make sure this is all combined. And what you are doing now is that you are creating what is called a panade. And you are getting all those starches active. Look at that, immediately thickened up. And you're gelatinizing, you're gelatinizing the flour. And so that's that very peculiar texture of the shoe, which is so fantastic when you bake it. When you gelatinize a flour, you're really enhancing some of those starches. And it's essentially a giant roux. Right. A giant, giant roux. So now that that's thick, I'm going to put it back on the heat. And the reason that I take it off the heat before I add the flour, if I have a <clears throat> constant heat source right there, when you dump the flour all at once, it just goes boom right towards the middle. And if there's still heat hitting the bottom of it, some of that flour just pills up and seizes. And it's really hard to get that smushed out. So you'll end up having these little bits of very hard, almost rice-like grains of flour. And what I do at this point, I'm no longer stirring vigorously. I call this the petting stage. I was taught to stir it now until you see a film on the bottom. I am, that and that's doing? what I'm doing is I'm, I'm waiting for that film. But the reason that I don't stir it is so, because I don't, it, in case a part of it has that hard film on it, I yeah. don't want to scrape that yeah. up into the, into the panade. So I, this is why I call it petting. Yeah. Because I'm not being vi very vigorous so that I don't disturb that film on the bottom. And by evaporating some of the moisture, moisture in this phase, it'll take more egg. It'll take so it'll more rise egg. More. It'll rise more. And at this point, that flour in gelatinizing has pretty much absorbed what it can. So all that excess moisture is going bye-bye. So you're looking for that film on the bottom that you don't want to scrape up. And I always say, how do you know you have enough film? Will it make you angry when you wash the dish? <laughs> if, if you look at this, look, if you look at this and you go, that's going to be a pain in the butt to clean. See that? This is what I'm talking yeah, about the film. And Ray's the one who cleans it when I teach. So if it's going to make Ray grumpy, that's good. 
So now I'm going to just add this to my mixing bowl. You can actually do this all by hand. You can also do this in a um, food processor. I'm careful not to scrape up any of that skin. Sorry, Ray. And now I'm going to allow some of this heat to dissipate before I add the eggs and I'll mix this. And so usually my indicator for when it's okay to start adding eggs is once I start mixing, you will hopefully see some of that steam. Yes, I see steam. Mm -hmm. So if it still looks like you are at an Aerosmith concert with all that dry ice, it is too soon to add the eggs because if you add it too soon and it's too hot, then you'll have um, a really gross breakfast scramble. So you're gonna be waiting for that just to stop being so steamy. And the recipe calls for four eggs. I have five eggs because sometimes you will need more, sometimes you will need less. And either way, I always whisk the eggs together because there is a chance you will need four and a half eggs. And if you just put them in willy-nilly without scrambling them, then you know that white will be the first one to go in. Mm -hmm. And then you have no yolk going for the ride. So I always whisk them up. And then if you have egg left over, omelet. A tiny, tiny, <laughs> smallest omelet ever. So in here already is a panade. You can follow along with the recipe. I also added my pastry cream recipe to the very bottom of the description. So that incredibly easy to do. I'm going to be filling this with, how's this looking? Do you see steam? I'm gonna start adding. But make sure that when you do add the egg that you keep that motor running and it's on a relatively low speed so that I'm not trying to aerate this, right? I don't want all these willy-nilly bubbles creating an uneven shoe, but I do want it to mix. So if I added this without having the mixer going, you would get that lovely scrambled egg. And this is what I call, at this point, the puberty of shoe. It is no longer a panade because I've added the egg, started to, but at this point it's not come together and it just looks like it really needs some help. It wants to be alone. It looks gross and chunky. So hence the puberty of shoe. And now it's starting to come together and I want you to see what this looks like. This is really dry, though it's becoming cohesive. And I'm gonna start scraping this. Always make sure you've got the rubber spatula around. So I'm gonna start scraping this, but can you see how dry this looks at this point? Um, so it's gonna need more egg. So I'm gonna continue adding egg until it gets very shiny. And you no longer see tracks in the mix. So I'll show you what that means. As you're going around, you'll start seeing that the paddle will leave track marks as it makes, ooh, get in the paddle. Let's scrape that up. We all remember what puberty was like. We just wanted to close that door, no one see us, so we can get over all those awkward moments all by ourselves. I'm sorry that this poor what? shoe. <laughs> what? Yeah, my life. Okay, so you can see it's already coming apart again, but it will come to be a cohesive, shiny mass. And I think I have about a little over one egg to go in, but before I add the rest of it, I want this to start coming together again because you can see some of that egg is still riding in between those bits of panade. And here it comes, here it comes, here we go. Let's see what it looks like. Starting to slowly come together. Gonna add a little more egg. And now you can see what I mean by the tracks as it goes around. It's leaving these striations and they look ragged still. See what I mean? Almost like a pinwheel as it goes around. But it doesn't look very shiny and it looks a little ragged or shaggy. So I'm gonna continue adding a little more egg. And then there's a point where you're gonna be looking at this and you're not sure. You're gonna ask yourself, well, it looks better. It looks shinier. It doesn't look so ragged. Do I need to add more egg? Well, you can actually just do a visual check by lifting up the paddle. And then you can also do a finger test. And I will show you, it's called a trough test. It's very fancy. You just need your finger and a little piece of parchment. Now you're thinking, it's shinier. 
maybe a little more egg. So after that, I've just got a little bit left, and you're thinking to yourself, it looks good, I'm not sure. Can you add too much egg? Yes, you can. And what can, are the consequences? And the consequences are you will just have a little pancake. It'll flatten out. It will flatten yeah. out. It will weigh it all down. Um, so you're like, but you want to add enough egg that you get that wonderful, that it does do its job. It gets that wonderful flavor. You have that shininess, everything that you want from shoe. So you're going to have to figure it out either just visually looking at it in the mixer, which you can do, or you can do the trough test, which we will do right now. So it's shinier. It's got a nice V. I think it could probably take a little more egg, but let's do the trough test. Piece of parchment. Going to put a decent dollop down of the shoe. Going to wet my finger a little. This is very fancy, isn't it? And I'm going to put my finger down here, draw it all the way through, and I'm watching what happens when I lift my finger. Now I'm looking at this wall here. See how that's staying stable? But this was nice and soft. So that's a, an indicator right there where it's nice and soft. Watch this again, how it just plopped over. That you have saturated with enough egg, but it's keeping its shape so that you know you haven't added too much. That when you pipe it, it'll stay where you put it. So that's a good indicator if you're just confused about the process. And I mean, you've got all these things at home. Finger, some water, some parchment. And now for piping. So I've got a couple piping tools. This is plain, so look at this plain tip. When I'm doing profiteroles or larger cream puffs, I'll use a larger tip, but choquette are pretty petite, so I use this one. You're going to ask me what the size is, and I'm not going to know unless I look at it. I can't see. It is an Ateco 80, 80, 80, 80 something. <laughs> Ateco. Open, plain tip, not huge, not too small. So when I fill this up, I make a nice little cuff for myself. If this were super runny, like say a macronage for macaron. Oh, see, we're shaking. I would twist this and tuck it in so that the shoe wouldn't just flow steadily, but this should have enough heft to it that it's not going to be flowing out quickly. And now let's do some piping. Just to make your work life easier, flatten the bag, take your bowl scraper, and try to get rid of any big air pockets. That's especially true if you're doing eclair, because there's nothing more sad, piping eclair, and they're looking perfectly, and all of a sudden you get a burp mm. in the shoe. That's not fun. But we're just going to be doing small little dollops. So we'll start here, one, two, and stop. Oh, you stop it. You come here. And if, as you are piping, you notice that you haven't filled up the entire sheet pan, then what you do is where it's empty, you put a little bit of shoe at the corner to tamp it down. Because in the oven, it will just lift up and adhere itself to the shoe. And then my other trick for these is I spray them with a little baker spray, which is a spray that has the flour in it in lieu of egg wash so they stay nice and light. And that also creates, I call them the spanks of shoe because what it does is it kind of contains them so they don't become so shoe-like. They don't become so cabbage-like. And this will also create a little adhesive for the pearl sugar. And when that has baked up, you will get something that is so tasty. There's a little choquette. You can see them there as well. They're actually really wonderful just by themselves, unfilled, because they're just sweet from that pearl sugar. And this is called Swedish pearl sugar. It doesn't brown, as you can see in the oven. But my favorite thing to do is to take a chopstick Get a hole in there, and you have to make sure that it's wide enough that whatever piping tip you're using can fit in there. And then 
you make sure before you fill it, you put a little pressure on the bag because if you don't, as you're going in, that little tip will be forced back into the bag. So just make sure it's big enough. And then you're putting a little pressure on there. And then you fill it up. And you should be able to feel it getting heavier. So get in there. I like the one with the teeth because it really grabs onto the inside. And I can literally feel the burps. And that is a choquette. Super tasty. And then you can see here that I used that um, inverse puff, the cocoa from last week, to create you know, I wouldn't, this is not a St. Honoré, but it's a little riff on it, right? A St. Honoré would have, be round, would have traditional puff, uh, and it would be one layer with a shoe piped on it, and then you do the St. Honoré tip with caramel coated filled cream puffs along the edges. But I think there's something nice about playing with your food. Oh, that's beautiful. What's the cream on the bottom? The cream on the bottom is just a vanilla pastry cream tube piped a little differently mm -hmm. so that it would create an even base. Mm. But you can play with flavors. And I also think that the, the, oftentimes the traditional things like uh, croque and bouche and honore, that caramel can be so off-putting just to yeah. eat through that it's nice to have an alternative where I just use ganache to adhere everything in mm -hmm. there. And then I made little truffles made from truffles. the ganache so that you have both the vanilla and the chocolate. And so as far play. as Saint Honoré goes, he's the patron saint of bakers uh, of and pastry bakers. chefs, and his saint's day was last week. It's in the middle of May. And every year in Paris, or all, all around France, they have La Fête du Pain, which is this big festival honoring bread making and food in general, but it's really based on bread. And right in front of Notre Dame, they build they put up a big structure and there's working bakeries in there and a quarter of a million people go through over the course of 12 days. Uh, America was invited to send a team two years ago yeah. and I happened to be able, I was the one who chose the team. That's exciting, did you go? So I was there all 12 days ah. and then that was the last year it happened because the next year was when Notre Dame Notre Dame. Burned. Oh, that's uh, yeah. so but lucky to you. But yeah, that's the other right. So really quickly, I just want to show you how I pipe my eclair and how it's different from just the profiterole or just the little bun, that you use a toothy piping tip to create ridges in the eclair, and that helps it to expand more uniformly. And then in the piping, I always put pressure down before I start, and then I make sure that I continue moving so I don't have a big old bam bam bone at the beginning and at the end. So again, I start piping and moving almost immediately. When I get to the end of it, I stop the pressure. I just touch the parchment ever so slightly, give myself a little tail. Hmm. In my first job, the pastry chef was a Frenchman, and we didn't have any ridged Oh, you, so can fork. Fork. you can use a fork. You can use a fork. So yeah, use the back of a fork to create the ridges. You don't need the fancy stuff. You can even just use a piping bag without the tip at all. Get them uniform. If you find that, and it's really hard, this is e looks easier than it actually is. I'm promising you. It's practice. It is practice, practice, practice. But there's a way to uh, cheat. Is that if you like them enough, but you find that they have some bulbous bits, Put the shoe in the freezer, not till it's frozen, but until it stiffens and you are able to take mm. a paring knife and trim them. Don't tell anyone you did it. Don't apologize, just do it. The other great thing about this is that you can make a batch of shoe and at the very end, add a cup of dry cheese. So Gruyere oh, would be the most typical. Gougere. For Gougere, for, for cheese puffs. I love using Vermont aged cheddar. Yeah. It's a cup of shredded dry cheese. If it's too moist, then you don't get the puff, then you don't get the texture. But it is so delicious, and it's one of my favorite things to make so quickly and to please your guests. So that is shoe. These are choquettes. You'll have fun making them. And now it's for more French. We're going to be going on to brioche. Wow. Yeah, brioche, that's really a magic dough. Is it bread? No. Is it pastry? No. It's sort of like those beings in the Odyssey and the Iliad that are not quite human, not quite gods. They're somewhere in between. Well, I would put brioche in the category of being closer to a god than anything. Uh, it's also an immensely versatile product, like the shoe. Mm -hmm. um, 
so Gazzino was talking about the gougere, where you put cheese into the pâte à choux, making savory products. Well, here too, you can make really nice savory products. And maybe I'll start with what I call brioche breakfast eggs. So this is 100 grams of brioche. It's nicely risen. And I'm going to dip my fingers in flour, go down gently, and pull this out. Obviously, these doughs were all prepped out a couple of hours ago, or almost a couple of hours ago, because otherwise we would need a three-hour program today. Also, the mix, we had it pre-recorded, so after this you'll be able to see how the dough was prepared, because it's, it is a wonderful thing to experience, because it's quite a bit different than more traditional doughs. It took me a while to appreciate brioche because my taste buds weren't ready for it yet. It's too delicate and kind of ethereal, and I was far from either of those for the, many of the early years of my baking life. And but it's also crucial, though, because it is that, so delicate and ethereal that in handling it, it should be cool when you're shaping it. You have it. to work it up when it's cold. There's so much butter. This particular formula has 50% butter based on flour weight. And if you tried to work it up while it was room temperature, you would be inventing some new expletives for sure. Also uh, important to note that you, uh, when you watch the mix, that Jeffrey used uh, European butter, an 86% butter. But yeah. You, but um, what would the quality differences be if you just had uh, American 80%? If that's all you have, you'll still be able to make a great product. It won't have quite the same level of richness. I mean, the reason why 82, 83, 86% butter costs more is because butter fat is a lot more expensive than water. And 80% butter is going to have more water. Okay, so first step here was to open up these hollows. You'll notice there's a film of dough on the bottom. This one might need just a little more opening. And I'm being careful though not to collapse the rim. That one went right through. Okay, now here I have some mushrooms that I, oh, one thing first. I'm going to put a little smear of either sour cream or creme fraiche in the bottom, just to give one little extra flavor. Spread that out. And that's just plain, you haven't put anything, salt or anything in there? No, that. I haven't. And in fact, I prefer to use creme fraiche, but yes. um, true confessions, there's creme fraiche in this quiche filling. Ah, yeah. And right after I mix the filling, what did I see? The, it, it, was, it looked like small print. It said Madagascar vanilla. Oh, there you go. In a savory quiche. So I said, ooh, ooh. Oh, that so is right. So that's why I'm using uh, sour cream. Okay, next goes in some sauteed mushrooms with salt and pepper, a lot of garlic, and fresh herbs. We had thyme coming up nicely in the garden. So that's what's in here. After that, we're going to actually crack an egg. That's why you've got to make sure your hollow is open enough. And then Delicious. some salt and pepper to taste. You guys like salt and pepper? Because these are staying here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. An alternative would be to use um, some cooked, chopped bacon instead of the mushroom mix. This is grated Parmesan. These will bake in about 14 to 15 minutes. Oh, that's perfect for... You want the egg to be more or less cooked, but maybe just a little bit jiggly. Okay. Then, some Swedish pearl sugar for these little guys. These are just little buns. Now, 
there are two types of sugar that are like this. this is the Swedish and then there's the, is it the Belgian sugar? I'm not familiar it, with that one. The Belgian sugar is the same type of sugar, just larger. Oh, I um, see. So when you have those wonderful um, Liege waffles, uh -huh. yeah. it, it oh, is sure. that Belgian right. sugar that is the same type in that it's very white like that, just bigger chunks. And so when I get is, around it, I eat it like candy. This is Brioche Nanterre. Nanterre is a city in France, and it's well known for a very simple but very, very tasty um, loaf, either made with eight balls, 50 grams each, or sometimes people do four or five cylinders crosswise. Here we have, I love this loaf pan. Um, I was teaching in Russia a few times over the last couple of years, and I was gifted with some of these. They're very, very common in Russia, and I think they're just cute as can be. And here we have some cinnamon buns with a cinnamon almond cream. We're going to put all these in the oven, and there's one other product that's under refrigeration that will go in the oven, and then I'll start demonstrating how all these products got to this place. Okay? In the meantime, while Jeffrey loads, when I loaded my shoe, I put it in a 375 oven. If you're loading a lot of things at once, have the oven at 400. And then when you have the doors open, obviously some heat escapes. Load everything in, close the doors, and then you can reduce the, three, the heat to 375. Here's the thing. Do not open that oven for like 15, 20 minutes. Do not do it. Don't load things piecemeal and then decide, oh, 10 minutes, I need to load this in now. Don't do it. Wait. Because what will happen is that that shoe will collapse. Ah! The other thing that if you have sheet pans that are not heavy enough and that the gauge of steel is very light, sometimes the underside of the little shoe buns or the eclairs will bow a little. And also be careful if you have a really, really strong fan in your oven, if you can reduce it, if you have the option between convection and conventional and your convection has a very strong fan, use conventional because it can blow around your shoe because as it steams and it expands, it gets very light. Um, and next week I'll be making Winbeutel Torte, which Winbeutel is the German word for p the cream puff, and it means windbag because it's just empty inside and it can float around. So we're going to make a cake from the cream puffs. But just be sure that they don't go floating around your oven, have it at the low speed so that you don't have that fan going. Are you okay. ready to continue? Yes. Now I'm going to take brioche dough that I scaled earlier, quite a bit earlier actually, and I draped it into this seven inch pan. This is called flamiche, which is an old colloquial word in France for quiche. Um, it's a very, very lovely product. So I rolled out the dough to about an eighth of an inch thick, draped it in, but didn't make the walls right away. Now it's very relaxed, and now I'll go around and make the walls. If I had made them right after putting it in here, invariably they would have shrunk, and that would have made it stick terribly when the filling rose. So now I go around, and I want to really take care and make sure that the walls go straight down and then we have a right angle. If it's like this, I find that to be a defect. So take your time on that. I call that hammocking. Trim the excess. And what's the depth, of, uh, would you say, is about an eighth of an inch? The thickness is about yeah. an eighth, yeah, yeah. Now this is the Flamiche filling, which is <coughs> Madagascar vanilla creme <laughs> fraiche. One egg. Hey, you've invented something new. Yeah. 50 grams of a very good hard cheese. It's similar to a kind of a hard cow's mountain cheese. Um, it, it is better. And the instructions, I said, sprinkle on the cheese and then pour on the custard. But you'll get it more evenly if you mix them together like this. This cheese is called Tarantes. It's made just two towns away from here. They've won national prizes for their cheeses. They're exceptionally good. It's a it's raw so good. Jersey cow cheese, and it's really good. And the owners are delightful people, and they deserve all the praise they get. So this seems odd that you have a savory product with a crust that's brioche. No. This doesn't proof. Once you've made it, it goes right in the oven. 
So I will do that now. I should put that on another do you want sheet, sheet pan. Yeah, I got one here. How long does this one bake? This one's probably going to be about 26 minutes. I'm going right. to the top rack. I'll get a nice. Yeah, that's better. It's on the top rack. Is it a little hotter up there? Yes. Okay, so that went in at 35. And then you can see the shoe buns. They're starting to get a little bouncy. Again, this is a time that you do not want to open that oven. They're still very fragile. And you would open it and watch them go very sad and collapse. Don't do it. What's next? Next, I'm going to shape all the products that we just made. Again, if you're just joining us, Jeffrey is shaping brioche dough. We pre-recorded the mix of the dough because it took over 20 minutes. So that after this, we'll be loading that so you can watch the mix. Because it does take so long, uh, it is an indicator to you that you have to be really patient when you make this dough. You can see Jeffrey right there in the corner. He is making that cold butter more pliable. The other thing too is if you look at the recipe, you want to make sure that all the ingredients are incredibly cold before you even start the mix. So you've got to give yourself a little time for prep just to make sure that everything you're using is nice and cold. Otherwise you will have greasy brioche and that's not a good thing. Maybe someone out there likes greasy brioche, I don't. Oh, look at that beautiful dough. Okay. Now you're going to be shaping. I'm gonna shape. Exactly what we saw you put in the oven. Exactly. So, this is for the cinnamon buns when they come out of the oven. It's Ooh, a little yeah. bit of a glaze. You so want to put just, that over here? I'd love to put it right there. <laughs> you want to put that glaze over here with me? Thank okay. You. Let's start with the brioche nanterre. And again, in the interest of time, all this was divided and pre-shaped some time ago. So this is 10 balls, 50 grams each. This is a Pullman pan. It's slightly bigger than the one that I just loaded, but it should still do a good job. You know what, I should have done 10 and not, the, the area is more. Would you mind getting that dough, that I, the extra dough? Yes. Okay, we'll put in another two in a moment. Here we have the brioche breakfast eggs, thanks so much. Those can go here. That And that's where you made the little hollow. Oh, no, 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 no. That's for here. Those are too big. My hands were saying, wait a minute. That's 100 grams? That's more than 100 grams. These are the breakfast eggs. See? This is where practice really comes in handy. These are the Swedish pearl sugar. And then for the non-tear, did you need just two more to fill that pan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right now, is how are you feeling um, heat-wise? Because it's warmer in Vermont today than it has been. Uh, you have left this under refrigeration until you just Oh, yes, until, until start, this moment. Until yeah. this moment. So, but it's still okay. If I were doing it without, you know, I mean, we're trying to choreograph something a lot more complicated than baking alone in your own kitchen. Right. So typically what I would have done was divided this cold, pre-shaped it, and then go right to the final shaping without this intermediary step. But we right. both knew that we were going to have a pretty lengthy time before this was going to get worked up. That is such a cute loaf pan. Okay. That's that. Now I'll scale out two more for our Nanterre. There was a question that I saw. Now, um, does it make a difference using a bag versus just saran wrapping your dough when you do the final proof? Um, well, I think the main reason I like the bag is that I can use it a hundred times. Saran wrap is one shot and you throw it out. So it's also a heavier mill, so it probably does offer more protection to the dough. I also find that often when you're doing a sheet pan proof that you have to use several sheets of plastic wrap and oftentimes yeah. you'll get a gap in there and it'll create a skin on some of the dough, so it's kind of a little safer. It's, it's more too, I mean, since I've spent my work life largely as a baker, 
I've been well aware that you know any food professional is going to use a greater percentage of the world's resources than non-food professionals, and that gives us an incentive, either economically or ethically or both, to be as conservative as we can. And so, if I can use this a hundred times or more, I'd much rather do that than be running through a roll of this every week. So. So once again, to make these rolls, dry hands, not a dry bench, however. Squeeze it, lay it down, and then I'm going to make a cage with, with my hand. And this is all going to be on the bench the entire time. If it's a big roll, my hand's out here. If it's a small roll, my hand's in here. And I'm just making the dough come together by rotating it between. Well, you can see my thumb is a big part of the action. My, the pinky is kind of the corresponding part of the action on the other side of the hand. You can see that? That's how it comes together. Okay. And is there, do you find that there's a difference between the, the final proof time of an enriched dough like this versus a lean dough? There will be, yeah. Um, this is not osmotolerant yeast. I'm assuming that most people don't want to have a whole bunch of different types of yeast at home, so I Is just use regular mix? instant. But yeah. um, you'll notice there's something like 3% yeast in the formula page. That's because the instant dry yeast that I've been using is not going to have as much gassing power, so there's mm -hmm. a somewhat elevated percentage of yeast. Right, right. yes. All right, next I'm going to make the cinnamon buns with almond cream. And even with a more traditional cinnamon bun roll, you want to work with the dough really cold. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, it's even more important. If you think about that this dough is 50% weight in butter to flour, that can go sideways very quickly if you don't have it nice and cold. And it's a joy to work with when it's cold. It feels like Play-Doh. So I'm going to roll this slab out, which weighs 400 grams, to roughly 10 by 14. So that was 400 grams total? 400 grams, yep. yeah. Again, another great reason to have a scale. I'm going to put this in the fridge. Yeah. You could put that into the Flemish. I'm going to shape later. Oh, this is, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to fridge this little piece? Please. You got so it. this does have shrink. So if I want 10 inches, I should roll it out to about 11 inches so that it can shrink down to the proper size. It'll actually get a little bit wider, or longer, I should say, as I roll it up. So therefore, I don't have to go the full 14 inches now. That's only about 12. I've actually got a ruler here. I really like that you're put that, that it's almond and cinnamon. That is a lovely combination. Oh, good. Well, it's going to be staying here, so you can find out with your I taste approve. Buds. Ray and I approve. Okay, that should be pretty good. So, I'll make it slightly narrower here. Give it a bed of a little line of egg wash. Egg wash has two functions. Function one is to be shot to provide shine to a product. In this case, I'm not after shine. What I'm after is tackiness. I want it to be glue. That's the other job description for egg wash. All right. We'll take a peek at, oh, look at those. Oh, those are beautiful. Ah, it blew over. That's okay. This is done. This is done. Asbestos fingers. That'll need another three minutes. Okay. So here's our little puffs. I think I jostled the eggs when I was putting them in there, the breakfast eggs, and so the whites it's flew over. Yeah, it's going to be delicious. Okay. Here we have almond cream with some cinnamon in it. And 
and what's in this? Uh, the recipe's there, but... Well, you know, when, in my first job, which I seem to keep going back to, every Monday was almond cream day. And it was the same recipe. Four kilos of almonds, four kilos of sugar, four kilos of butter, 96 eggs. So this is a somewhat <laughs> downsized version. But that was every yeah. single Monday. So just whole almonds with skin and everything? Yeah, we used, yeah. Uh, my boss didn't like using a food processor for the almonds because just like sort of a coffee mill where oh, interesting. it just spins around yeah. and around and around. So she had a flaker. So the almonds would go through once and just flake. Interesting. Yeah. And Was this the German? Yes, yes. yes. And I kind of, I like her philosophy as far as that goes. Well, you know, you you come to do things and it's either habit or you find that you just like the outcome of the product better. Exactly. And I just got to say that Germans and almonds are, are very good friends. Yeah. This is optional, but I think it gives a nice nutty flavor to it. I can't see my glasses on. This is walnuts? just busted up walnuts. You can use pecans. And again, it's optional. And at this point, if you find that as you start rolling, that the dough is feeling very warm, would you put this back in the refrigerator to stiffen up yeah, or just continue? Probably. Yeah. Although I'd probably continue. But it's n never a bad idea to put it back in if it's getting too warm. Yeah. That butter just will seize right on up. These are yellow raisins. You can use no raisins or you can use dark raisins. Now I'm going to fold this up. So make that first turn and then try to make as tight as possible And as cylinder. you are tucking it in, are you pulling it a little as well? Well, I want you to watch here. You'll see that if I keep going this way, I'm not going to get even results. And so I'm making sure that I'm staying right in this line on this side and this line on this side. And then when I get to the bottom, watch this. Instead of just rolling straight down, I'll pull this out so that the edge is hitting the glued bottom portion. Okay, there's that. Now I do want this to be 14 inches so that I can have seven even pieces. Can you pull out those breakfast eggs, please? Yes. Thank you. Keep the uh, smaller loaf in. Yeah, that'll need a little more time. That, okay. That one in it. Uh, I don't have your asbestos hands. I'm going to grab a... Yeah. Okay, so get it to 14 inches. Score it with a knife so that you know you're going to be getting nice, even pieces. Then go back and make your cuts. The one that's in the oven now, I actually baked in a ring, but I didn't have a second ring. So for this one, I'm using a, a nine inch cake pan. So lay them around evenly. Oh, you know what's a, well, no, that's okay. I take that back. This one looks a little too big. And this one looks a little too small, so I just took a little snip off the bigger one. <laughs> Stick it on the bottom, nobody's the wiser. Okay, there's those. And how long do These those are proof? Prove? Hour and three quarters ish. Yeah. Of course, it depends a lot on your environment. Yeah. Um, we heat with wood at home, and so the winter, the kitchen can be, I probably shouldn't admit this, but it might be in the upper 40s, lower 50s, and mm -hmm. that's not a very favorable environment for proofing things. So I either, we grow all of our vegetables and we have heat mats, so I rigged up a sort of a proof box using the heat mat. I, I have, I use warming pads. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that you would use for back aches. I don't use it, my warming pads for that. I use them for proofing in the winter because it's really cold here as well. And I, I prefer a cooler proofing environment for a croissant, so it's perfect for that. 
but for anything else, not so much. And the other thing you can do, which is quite effective, uh, in fact, it can be a little too much of a good thing, um, you can bring some water to a boil in a saucepan, put that in your oven, and then put your products in there too. Just make sure you take the temperature of the oven now and again. If you got the brioche above, I don't know, oh, if you got it up towards 90, you're risking the butter oozing out. Oozing out. Let's see what we got. Oh, that's oh. looking lovely. There is a mitt right behind you. Okay. And some towels as well. Let's see how this guy's doing. Nope, that's young. Why do I say that's young? I can see how pale it is here and here. So there, there's no reason to look any further. So how much, we, could you estimate how much longer that would take? Three, three or four minutes. And the non tear is looking beautiful. non tear is looking beautiful. I'll pull that out, but then I want to show you what to be on the lookout for. Ah, uh, that's, see how pale that is? That's the indication. It's not ready yet. If I took it out and left it out, See how pale it is there? It's got to be a much richer color. If I to took it out now because, oh, I touched the top and it feels hard. Well, it felt hard 10 minutes ago, and it certainly wasn't done. And it certainly isn't done now. What would happen if I did take it out now? Within five minutes, it's going to look like this. And it's not a centerfold. It's a yeah. piece of something to eat. And then the quiche, did you ch take a look at that? Yeah, that's, that's got a ways to go, too. OK. So uh, look at how terrible that one looks. Here's one the looks breakfast great. egg. That's a breakfast That's egg. That's good. You guys are going to get both of these, as You're I said. Both. Um, and I wanted to also show that the, this is the. Um, oh, it's, it's a rolling a, pin. This is a rolling pin. This is actually the butter that I use for things like brioche and lamination. And it's a cultured butter, but you can see here it says 86% butter fat which is kind of an unusual thing to see. And you, it's unusual because usually they don't want to admit how low butter How low it is, that's right, <laughs> that's right. So this is unsalted. Um, and this is just, to me, the dreamy stuff. This is the good stuff. A bird just got in here. Did you see ah! the bird You saw that? Yeah. Mm. Mm. So these, mm. the, <laughs> no, I look at her too. So I think these, if you don't have a sweet tooth, this might satisfy you as mm -hmm. is, but a little pastry cream. And I don't lighten the pastry cream that I fill these with because you have a structure to hold it and it's like this custard inside. When I'm piping, however, that's when I use that whipped cream to fold it in, make sure that it's stiff enough and that you work very softly, that you fold gently so that you keep all that stiffness so that it holds its shape when you do pipe. If you over whip as you're piping, if it's just straight whipped cream or even mixed with the pastry cream, you'll see these edges here of the St. Honoré tip will start looking ragged. And that usually is an indication that you have over whipped your cream. So kind of take it back a little, make sure that it isn't so stiff that it start chunking up, that it still looks smooth. Um, I would love to be able to glaze these guys. Those are beautiful. I think these are done. Yeah. And so what are you looking for with those? Because well, I would think that these are a little harder to get a, a good bead because well, they have that filling. Right. These I actually want to be a little soft. They're oh. going to support each other and hold each other up. And right. you don't want them to have any sense of dryness when you eat it. No. And if you're not going to eat it warm, then you're going to want to reheat it, which right. is going to have a slight drying effect. So these I would prefer to take out. And you can see how nice it is to use a ring. Yes. I love the ring. Right. Also, if I am also a huge fan of very soft uh, rolls like this. And what I will do if I find that I don't think that they are baked interiorly, but they start growing like this and getting too brown for my taste, I will put some, some aluminum foil. foil. Sure. I'll tent it so that you don't, if you don't like the really, um, they're actually very tasty bits, but the little harder baked bits, just put a little tent over it. But also that glaze, when you do it warm, will, will soften yeah, that you'll up as wanna, well. That's right. You want to do this glaze, which is simply water, confectioner, sugar, and a little lime juice. You could use lemon or a lime. Uh, you want to do that when it's hot. It's not going to shine like fondant would on a cool pastry, and it's right. not meant to. You want it to kind of ooze here and there and just give everything a nice shine and a little extra flavor. And I think those who, like me, like extra glaze, you can have a little extra to brush on or pour on after it is cool. <laughs> okay, now that I know you like extra glaze, you're going to get it. 
Okay. I love the There's answer that. Thing. All right. I want to just um, demonstrate the flamiche, the rolling of the flamiche. Which is the quiche. Yeah. Um, or at least I want to describe it. Rolling it out isn't such a big deal. Where is that dough in there, the flamiche? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Here, I've got the oven up. Yeah, this is not, well, it might be done. We've got another minute or two. And okay, so well, show be, us how to do this. Do you have your, your ring is Well, taken, the right? ring is unfortunately in use. Now, by the way, I did a very small one. During the week, I make my product three different times. Um, that's a lot of stuff. Gazina makes it once, then she mixes a dough for me. So we're doing a lot of things. Normally, I wouldn't make such a small quiche. Uh, included in the description is for a 9 or a 10 inch ring, which I would find to be much preferable. Thank you for that, Kazina. So if you triple, where's the flour at now? What did I do with the flour? Over there. Oh, here it is. If you were to triple the filling, the eggs, creme fraiche, and pepper. Then you would um, be able to use like a 9 or a 10 inch ring, which is a much more substantial and I think a much nicer product. So anyway, the method for this is, this ring might be too big to show, but you want to make a circle. You want to roll a circle. And for me, the easiest way to do that is to roll an oval. but leaving a lip here, then turning it sideways and rolling it again. Now I can use just the edge of my pin to just bring out the area that needs a little bit of help. That's why I love a shape pin or a French pin. Yeah. It's also nice because you can go like this and you don't bang your knuckles on the bench. Exactly. So again, you'll want to make this a little oversized because it's going to have shrink to it. And this, you said, is not, you don't proof it. You No, you don't. What you'll do is, again, this is probably a little too big, but you'll make it oversized. Yeah, this is oversized. So just focus on, on here, Ray. So the entire circumference should have some overhang like this. So this is flared up now. It's not down to the bottom and in. Now I'll refrigerate it for 10 or 15 minutes to let it relax. Then pull it out, it'll be cold. Then you can make your final ring. So what you saw me do at the start of my segment was taking it out, making those vertical walls, and then trimming the excess. So that's how you'll want to handle it. Okay? Let's see how things are. And if you are, I'm sure you've been with us for a while, but look at the description and you can see the recipes there, the links are there. And we've even, um, I think we've discussed what we want to do next week, haven't we? Oh, yes. So you're already talking with all kinds of umlauts, what you're doing. Yes. What's the name of it again? Windbeutel Torte. Windbag cake. Okay. Because I talk. Okay. Here's that's the, beautiful. That's Look cute, at that. That's cute, isn't it? Yeah. And doesn't Nanterre traditionally have eight? Traditionally um, eight or yeah. four or five cylinders across is another method that's pretty common. That is just, and it's a wonderful way of having uh, an easily transportable bread, but you can tear it apart yeah. and get your own little. And brioche is magnificent left over if you make French toast with it. It's, it's fantastic. And, so yep. many, many possibilities. All right, I'm going to pull the quiche out, and that will be our last product. And for next week, you are going to make. Oh, next week, I'm going to make semolina bread. It'll be a naturally leavened sourdough bread using durum flour, which is the flour form of um, semolina is the sandy form of the grain, and durum is when it's milled into real fineness. Those of you who saw the pasta show saw the durum flour because we use that in if the pasta. If you can't find the durum, can you use the coarser? You can use the coarser. Yep, you yep. sure can. You might need to keep a little closer eye on the hydration. I have found that semolina flour, the coarser type, is actually not so hard to find. 
um, in the grocery store. And what, what do we have? We have the quiche in there? Yep. Can you take just, that out? Yep. I filled some buns. Okay, here's the last thing is the flamiche. By the way, this flamiche, the original one was made in the Picardy region of northern France, quite close to Belgium. And the cheese was made in monasteries. Mm -hmm. There's evidence of this cheese going back to the year 962. Wow. Uh, the cheese is called Mahual. It's almost impossible to find in the States, but what you can use as a good substitute would be a very good quality washed rind Munster cheese. Mm. If you're doing that, you cube the cheese into small cubes. But if you're using a hard cheese like this, you're great you great it. That's beautiful. So anyway, next week, Gazina, I'm going to make a naturally leavened sourdough bread. And just to change things up a little bit, I'm going to hand mix it so you can see that. That's great. Right? Right. So check the links. All the recipes are there. Thank you for playing with us. The mix. You did the mix separately. So that will be posted soon so you can see all the care that's taken to making brioche dough. Thank you so much. Be safe. Yeah, be safe and optimistic. And make pastry.